Ray Crone from Arizona, who was convicted of a brutal murder of a waitress in a bathroom stall, a horrible crime. And she had bite, mark, bite marks, and he was convicted based on bite mark evidence. And there's a quote from him where he said something like, um, when I sat at my trial and I saw the jury listening to that expert talking about the bite marks, I knew I was going to be convicted. He says, junk science convicted me, but real science saved me. And that, to me, just sums it up. It's, you know, DNA science is a science that was created in the scientific world. It was, you know, it's peer reviewed, it's judged, it's, you know, the scientific validity of it is unquestioned. And that's because it sort of was created organically on its own. And then people recognized and said, holy cow, that's an amazing tool that could be used forensically and could be used to investigate crimes and could be used in courtrooms. And so it was taken and now it's used forensically. But you contrast that to the forensic sciences that are used in the courtroom every day, like, you know, fingerprints, bite marks, um, you know, all the different sciences, quote unquote, and they all evolved out of the courtroom. So you had, you know, the forensic scientists themselves sort of build the science. And there's no way to ever go back and make it that purely scientific field. And so the security just doesn't exist for those fields like it does with DNA. And that's what I think it's so powerful because it can't be questioned. Being able to differentiate opinion from science. Uh, you know, every, uh, unfortunately, much of what is taught, not only in medicine, but in uh, in law enforcement and criminalistics is not science at all, it's somebody's opinion. And a good example of that, I think, is, is arson investigation, which is not based on science at all. Uh, hair analysis, which has been recently proved to be just nonsense, uh, and that never should have happened because people should have demanded uh, scientific evidence for what they were saying. And the same thing is true in the Shaken Baby Syndrome. That never should have happened. It just should not have happened. And I think that's unique in, in, in medicine. In, in all other areas of medicine, there is self-correction. If you're a physician and you make a diagnosis of appendicitis or pneumonia or breast cancer, uh, or a broken leg, there is a way for you to know whether you're right or wrong. And if you keep on making the wrong diagnosis, let's say acute appendicitis, for example, it's not very long before that catches up with you and the quality control at the hospital uh, where you work or whatever is going to say, hey, you know, these diagnoses are wrong. You've got to change your criteria for making the diagnosis. And that's true in all areas of medicine, except for child abuse evaluation. In child abuse evaluation, the, um, the gold standard for determining whether you are correct or incorrect is either confessions by somebody who was charged or conviction in a court of law. And if you look at the published series articles on this, those are exactly the criteria they use if they don't use uh, something like multidisciplinary team consensus. So that's that's the problem. It's not just it's I, I don't think it's um, I don't think it's fair to even say that it's a scientific disagreement because it's not science at all. It's failure to recognize and differentiate science from opinion. When you put into that mix, you know, faulty forensics, including bite marks and, you know, different impression marks, um, even fingerprints to an extent, things that an examiner who's paid by the state or the prosecutor's office has, you know, in most cases, a bias towards the defendant. They're doing a comparison from a crime scene print to a def known defendant's marks, um, you know, those things are really controversial and should be questioned more. But because of, you know, the the way that prosecutors get all of this credibility, it's put on as if it's just fact. And then when the defense comes in and tries to question it, it's seen as an attack on the person who the jury already really likes. And so they don't want to not believe what they're saying. Um,
And so that, I think, really creates a problem. Another um, area that we are uh, very um, pleased to be working on is in the area of hair microscopy, um, which simply means the examination of hairs under a microscope. Um, and in the, the problem was that in the 1980s and before, really, but in the 1980s and into the 1990s, in other words, prior to when mitochondrial DNA testing became available to examine hairs, hairs without a root, just a strand of hair without a root. Um, the problem was that there were numerous cases where uh, biologists were testifying to a match, quote unquote. That's a big word in a courtroom. That's the word match. What, the, what does that say to a juror? These two items are identical. And that's what biologists were testifying to, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And so, interestingly, in July of 2013, the Innocence Project in New York and the uh, National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers announced a joint agreement, and this is remarkable because of the nature of this agreement. The agreement was with the FBI and the Department of Justice. So these four entities entered into this agreement to, exa to examine over 21,000 cases where the FBI had um, provided testimony to hair microscopy results or opinions. Um, and th that examination is ongoing now. But what's interesting is those examinations only involve cases where an FBI examiner had testified. They did not touch upon cases that occurred in the states with a state lab person testifying. So this agreement was going to have nothing to do with those people. So our initiative um, involved going to law enforcement in this state with that agreement in hand and saying, hey, here's what's going on on the federal level. We need to do this at the state level as well. And at this point, we have reached, um, we're the, again, the very early stages of an agreement with um, the highest levels of law enforcement in this state to conduct a similar review of, we don't know how many cases yet, um, I imagine it'll be thousands, in the, in the low thousands um, of cases where an ISP a lab person gave testimony about, uh, about a comparison of two hairs, a hair found at a crime scene and a hair taken from, uh, taken from uh, a suspect. And what we're looking for, again, is where a biologist testified these two hairs match or are identical or came from the same person or something along those lines, which is a gross overstatement of the science. The science um, can't do what that testimony suggested that it could do. Now, hairs, if they have a root, can yield a regular DNA profile. And if it doesn't have a root, it can yield, as I said, a mitochondrial DNA profile. But back in the pre-DNA days, the testimony, the hair testimony was so important in these cases um, because there wasn't DNA to look at. And so um, there, we are very concerned that there are people sitting in prison still today who were convicted with that kind of hair testimony uh, playing a really big role. And that's the cases we want to look at. A law student, when I was in the clinic program at the Innocence Project, I was incredibly lucky to work on the case of um, the state of Mississippi versus Kennedy Brewer. And that was a death penalty case in Noxubee County, Mississippi. And um, I was involved in working on the bite mark aspect of that case. So in um, Brewer's case, the state was also intent on retrying him even after um, some DNA had come out and proven that he at least was not the source of semen that was found in the victim's body. And so the facts of the case are just, I mean, devastatingly sad. So um, Kenny Brewer was living in like a one room, um, very small um, home in Mississippi, um, basically like just very, very rural area. And um, he put his daughter to bed on a pallet under the window, you know, just in their one room home and wakes up in the morning and she's gone. And because he had been the person that was home with her, it does make sense that he's the person the police want to talk to and say, what happened? Um, and it's also worth noting that um, Mr. Brewer also did have some documented learning um, disabilities. Um, so he talks to the police, and they just zero in on him. And they're convinced that he committed this crime. So a few days after the little girl went missing, she was found floating in a creek 
that was um, maybe a couple hundred yards behind where they lived. And um, she was, like I said, she was floating in the creek. And when they pulled her out, she had a ton of marks all over the front of her body. So during the autopsy, Dr. Michael West, who's a very well-known um, medical examiner and um, someone who's very controversial and has been a part of a number of wrongful convictions, did that um, analysis and decided, I think it was 19 bite marks on the little girl's body, but they were all on one side of her body. And Dr. West uh, found and testified that they all came from Kenny Brewer. So they did also find semen inside the little girl's body, which DNA showed was not Mr. Brewer's semen. Um, so, you know, ordinarily one would think that would be pretty definitive. It's, it's like a toddler child, and that should be the, all you need to prove that he did not commit this crime. But there were still these lingering bite marks. And so I was at the time a student working with Vanessa Pockin, and we were sort of you know, set out to figure out what could have caused these bite, these alleged bite marks, these marks on the little girl's body. So we um, started doing some research on the area, and we, you know, knew that it had to be something from the water because she had been she had been in the water for a few days, and the marks were only on one side of her body, and so it sort of led us down this trail, and we um, were able to locate the like nation's best, you know, expert in all things crawfish and crayfish. And we realized that there's like a huge population of crawfish down in this area of Mississippi and that the way that crawfish feed is consistent with like two scrapes, which is what the bite marks looked like, alleged bite marks looked like on the little girl's body. And so we contacted this scientist and he actually flew down and I think he drove down to Mississippi Vanessa and I, and I'm a law student at the time, it was really exciting and a really great experience. So we flew into Birmingham and then drove into Mississippi into just this really rural area and literally met this scientist and put on big waders and went into the creek where the little girl had been located. And we laid crawfish traps and um, let them sort of sit overnight. This expert scientist, we went back the next day, collected the traps, they were full of crawfish. He took them back to his lab where he recreated the same stream conditions as in the creek and then put a baby pig, a dead baby pig, on the floating on top of the water. And the reason for doing that is that pig skin is the most similar to human skin. So if there's any kind of real testing to be done on what impression would be made on human skin, it's pig skin that's used. So lo and behold, all the crawfish went up and fed on the little pig skin and made the exact same marks that were found on the little girl's body. So we were able to prove that it was really the crawfish in the stream and in the creek that had caused those injuries and not Mr. Brewer. And what was really interesting as well is that there was another man from the same area, I think one county over, LaVon Brooks, who had been convicted of almost an identical crime. Um, his daughter, she was found floating in a pond, raped and murdered outside of his house, and he also had been convicted and sent to death row. And, you know, this is where you raise the question for prosecutors. Like, you get one of these things happens, and you have another one, and it's, I mean, they're so similar. And to not raise red flags and, and sort of do your own investigation, your own inquiry to, like, do we, did we do this right? You know, what is happening here? And as it turns out, you have some horrible person out there roaming the country, you know, committing heinous crimes against people because you have the wrong people locked up. Um, and ultimately, Kenny and LaVon were both released and are free today. And so that bite mark experiment was really, really interesting. So in 2004, 2005, when I first began at the project, I was assigned to Benny's case which is a Lake County um, sexual assault conviction. He had been sentenced to uh, initially 100 years in prison for the uh, rape, attempted rape, and aggravated battery of a 68-year-old woman in Waukegan, which happened in um, 1986, I believe. Um, and ultimately, just based on a procedural issue, his sentence was reduced to 60 years. But he did um, about a little over 21 years before being released from prison and then fought an additional um, like seven years, I believe, once out of prison to be fully exonerated and was just exonerated um, last year. In January of 1986, um, a 68-year-old woman 
left her apartment building in Waukegan, Illinois, um, went outside. She was walking down the street, sort of came around the corner of her apartment building, and a young black man grabbed her and pulled her down this sort of hillside. There was a big ravine in that area, and sort of pulled her down into this ravine and um, sexually assaulted her and tried to force her to perform oral sex on him and um, that during the struggle that her assailant bit her on the shoulder. The victim was taken to a hospital and they collected a rape kit, which included um, taking swabs of her vaginal area as well as other parts of her body. Um, all of those items were sealed in bags and placed into storage, you know, pending different testing that would be done on them. Um, the next morning, the police sort of went back to the crime scene once it was daylight, and they found in a different area of the ravine a large coat, a men's trench coat, and some other items, and the coat was belonged to Benny Starks. And um, police started looking for Benny, who did not match the victim, victim's description, by the way. Benny was 27 years old at the time, fairly light-skinned, he had different height, different body build, you know, very different from the description that the victim gave. Um, but this coat, for the, in their eyes, was a great lead. So they put the alert out, they're looking for Benny. Benny voluntarily goes into the police station and tells them, I didn't do this, but I know you're looking for me, but I was mugged that night and some guys took my coat, they took my, they stole my wallet, they stole all of my things, and I, they must have, I don't know if they did it or they dumped it or what happened, but I had nothing to do with it. And, you know, it sort of raises these sort of collateral issues that arise because the police didn't believe him. They well, why didn't you file a police report? And he was like, well, you wouldn't have believed me. The police, though, were convinced that he was the person that did this. And um, while the victim was in the hospital, they um, took a sort of mug books and different photographs of individuals and showed them to the victim. And in what we believe was a suggestive photo array, the victim selected Benny Stark's photo out of the identification lineup. Ultimately arrested and convicted. What I should also say is that three days into the victim's hospital stay is when they documented the bite mark that she had sustained during the attack. And the bite mark was on her shoulder and um, she had been beaten very severely. There's no question about that. And this was a horrible attack that happened to this woman. Um, and she's 68 years old, and her skin was fairly pliable, which all skin is anyway. It's not a good medium for keeping a, you know, any kind of impression mark. In you know, it's not a reliable way to keep an impression mark. But so, you have a woman, 68-year-old woman, who sustains this bite. She's swollen from head to toe. She's been beaten viciously, and she um, goes three days before they document the bite mark. So her, you know logic and science tells you that the way that the bite mark looked when it happened is not exactly the same way it looked once her skin swelled up and shrunk back down and three days passed. So and in any case, um, they took photographs of her shoulder and um, two dentists from the Waukegan area um, conducted this analysis. So they took some photographs of her shoulder. They then placed different rulers and things next to it, to sort of like keep markers of how big everything was. Um, they ultimately um, did a, an analysis where they compared the bite mark to Benny's dentition of his teeth, and they declared that it was a match. Um, what's interesting is that, and tragic, is that they used a methodology which is called the scoring sheet system which essentially my basic understanding of it is that they would take sort of different points of comparison and there would be a numerical calculation made and then that would declare a match. And that is the system that they use to do the analysis in Benny's case. Literally a year after his trial, the creators of that methodology issued a report completely um, saying, don't use this anymore. This is not reliable in court. Don't use this in court. And yet Benny had been convicted based on that a year prior and um, even all the way up through pending potential retrial after we had DNA that proved that he didn't commit this crime, the um, dentists and the state were still intent on relying on that same report and the same methodology that had been used. Um, so it was, you know, problematic.
the state essentially sort of, so to speak, latched on to the bite mark in the case and said, okay, you have all that evidence and maybe that's something the jury could hear at a new trial, but this bite mark exists and these dentists say that that's Benny's bite mark and so he obviously bit her. And um, at that time we knew we had to prove that this was just not right. And Benny was not there that night. The woman's testimony was clear. All of her accounts to police, even though they were strange and they varied, it was always one attacker. She never alleged that there was anybody else there. So the person who bit her is the person who raped her and it's all the same person. In Benny's case, we had to sort of go the science route and show that this bite mark was just not analyzed properly and that it wasn't Benny's teeth on the bite mark. And so looking back at the time of trial, the dentist, both of them testified in lengthy testimony in front of the jury and showed photograph after photograph and their whole process. So we got a couple of the, the preeminent experts in the world to review the, all the underlying evidence and the reports and everything in this case. And they ultimately came to the conclusion that not only is the methodology totally wrong, that you cannot rely on that scoring system, and they realized that when the initial photographs were taken of the victim's bite mark and of her shoulder, that they didn't place the ruler on a flat plane. So depending on you know the way a photograph is taken, it's not a precise measurement. So that was a huge, huge mistake that was made initially. And then when they finally got this final overlay to lay over, they never actually compared it back to Denny's dentition to make to Benny's dentition to make sure that it was actually accurate. So there's sort of errors along that process. Anyway, the methodology itself, even if done perfectly, was you know ruled out by its own creators and you know not to be used. But then on top of that, our experts who are you know literally write the textbooks on you know odontological science said that they actually had um, oriented the bite incorrectly. So the whole thing was that they said that this top row of teeth, which had this unique tooth characteristic of Benny that no one else has, made this mark. That they actually did it upside down. That the teeth that were left were actually the bottom teeth. Because when a person bites, it's the bottom teeth that move. It's the, bo the top teeth are what sort of secure what you're biting, and it's the bottom teeth that make the scraping marks and that move, and that it wasn't at all what they said it was. Um, ultimately, you know, we presented that to a judge. Um, you know, it was that among other factors where Benny's case was sort of finally reaching the precipice of final exoneration, um, but that wasn't even enough to really knock us out yet. Um, that was pending. The victim, in the meantime, since the trial had passed away, um, and so she was no longer available and could not be cross-examined at a retrial because she's obviously deceased. And based on the DNA and all of this new evidence, there's a, you know, a lot more of cross-examination material that Benny has a confrontation right to present and to question her on. And because she was unavailable, her, her testimony from the first trial, which is what the state was seeking to admit at a retrial, just to read it back in, was excluded. So based on all of those things, we sort of got to a point where they then um, dismissed the rape charges and the convictions, but still wanted to proceed on the aggravated battery based on the bite mark, which they still held on to. So really what happened, I mean, this is a very long story, but the short of what happened in Benny's case is he was finally exonerated because a prosecutor with um, respect for science took office, and one of the very first things he did in office was dismiss all the charges against Benny. Um, and it's really that um, acknowledgement of what the DNA proved and what you know the, the bite mark issues in that particular case. I'm not saying that they've taken a stance on bite marks because they haven't, but just an acknowledgement that the science in this case proved definitively that Benny Starks did not commit this rape.